Well, hello and welcome back to the Journey Home program. I'm your guest host, John Mark Grodi, tonight on this episode of the show. And again, we have this great opportunity to hear a story, to hear a journey of how the Lord brought uh, uh, one of his sons, in this case, uh, deeper into his heart, into his church. We're joined tonight by Jacob Imam, who's a former secularist from a Muslim background. He is the executive director of NewPolity.com. And Jacob, it's great to have you here, hey, man. It's great to be with you. It's yeah. always a pleasure. Yeah, likewise. Great to connect again. We we talked a little bit last year, was that? Yeah, I uh, guess here so. Here at the Coming yeah. Home Network yeah. on the Deep in Christ program. But yeah. I got to hear a little bit of your story then. I'm excited for the, the full thing today. So thanks for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. Awesome. Well, where should we begin? At Let's the, start, you know, at the birth? beginning. A very good place to yeah, start. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, where did the journey start? Well, you know, actually, I think the, the way that I... I like to think about this is actually with, through my parents because they were just so different in, in yeah. many, many regards. My mom was born into a Catholic family in Michigan. She was raised in the family, more or less stopped going to mass when she was 11. This is around the time of Vatican II. And kind of as the family stories report, there were some misgivings with Humanae Vitae and, and some of these uh, doctrines around in, in the church that uh, started to cause a wedge for her parents. Mm. Um, she, by the time that she went off to the Middle East, which is where she met and ultimately married my dad, uh, she wasn't practicing anything. My, my father, on the other hand, was born in Jerusalem, actually within the old city walls, uh, to a very uh, you know, noble Muslim family, uh, to the Imams. And they, they, as far as we can tell, uh, had been there for about 1,200 years, <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> so quite some time. Right. And he, uh, he, his father, excuse me, his, his grandfather uh, was the imam of Al-Aqsa, mm. uh, which is probably the third most holy site for, for Muslims. Uh, his father was uh, the mufti of Jerusalem, so like the juridical yeah. ruler of, of the town. Um, and there were some political kind of misgivings and things. And I, and I, and I think that those political misgivings uh, were really the, the beginning of, of our journey into the Catholic Church, um, <laughs> where there were some tensions that happened. Uh, and, and my grandfather, my, my father's father, uh, ended up not being involved within the more powerful religious community, um, really within the Muslim uh, community within Jerusalem anymore. He started the first local travel agency in <laughs> Jerusalem, actually. Uh -huh. And that was, uh, you know, a, an amazing career, an amazing job on its own, but it also started to um, just inch him away from seeing the world in the ways that his, his fathers had yeah. to the point where when he died and was kind of telling, or was dying rather, and was telling my father how, how to live, he recommended that he uh, not follow Sharia law, that he uh, find an, uh, a Christian woman to marry wow. and to start to go on a different path. But this was, this was, this was kind of surreal for my father and, and he couldn't quite process it because yeah. this was also a man who, uh, he was receiving this from a man who did pray, uh, who did read, you know, and recite Quran every day. And, um, and so when my mom did come along and, uh, he, from a from an American background, people yeah. in the Middle East often conflate those two. From you know, American equals Christian, right, right. And so oh, I'll do what my dad said, and and they, you know, and not to say that they weren't you know truly in love. I believe they were, and and certainly they were. Um, uh, but but that was you know I think just made a way uh, for for me to be able to come into the church. You now when I as I was raised, uh, my mom. Had uh, uh, was was it was many years after they they had met and married that I I did come along and sadly I was the only child. They bought me a dog later to make it up <laughs> to me, but uh, the, I was the only child. And uh, for them, uh, at that point, my my mom had uh, started to return to Christ, yeah. but it had only gotten as far as kind of a happy, clappy evangelical um, tradition, mm. and so I. I think that the most fair way to talk about how I was raised was kind of religiously schizophrenic in a, in a regard sure. with my father coming in, teaching me uh, Quran and teaching me about Muhammad. And then on the other hand, my mom sneaking in, uh, you know, at the beginning without him knowing and teaching me about uh, Jesus mm -hmm. and the sacred scriptures. So that was that was really how everything got kicked off. And, yeah. and I was fairly young, you know, uh, 
I, I actually remember quite clearly being four years old around the kitchen table yeah. um, when I realized that they really believed something different about God. Wow. And I think that there was a true witness in my mom's life that I hadn't seen in my, in my father's um, that made the Christian tradition more appealing Mm -hmm. and just seemed more true. I think that's Mm -hmm. more than anything. She'd wake up very early. She'd spend the first hour every day deep in prayer in the scriptures. Whereas when my father moved over, moved to the States, um, he had been more or less captivated with the the secularism, the liberalism. um, I mean, a term we can kind of talk about, I suppose, uh, in, in the States where you know, let's just kind of take this easy. We're not going to use religion as a tool, as, as a part of temporal power, of, of way of ordering society. Let's just let people be, make their own decisions. And, uh, and he was very successful. But, you know, at that, you know within, um, within finance, he kind of worked his way up. And, and that was kind of the order of life yeah. that was his order of life. Um, he certainly still believed in mm-hmm. Islam. He had those internal convictions, but they weren't governing the pattern and order of his life, if that right. makes sense, yeah. at that point. And so just in terms of seeing what are the, the truths that actually compel my parents to action, is it Islam on the one hand or is it Christianity on the other, just seemed like Christianity had a little bit more going for it because well, it didn't really change my mom all that much. She did get up earlier, you know. <laughs> she did pray more regularly than, yeah. than he did. Um, but, but you know, that was kind of it for me. Sure. I, I suppose that I, when I really figured out that there were two different things that they believed, I said, I, I just don't know what I, what I do believe. Right. And um, spent a number of years kind of wrestling and struggling over that. Mm-hmm. I went to a they ultimately sent me to this classical Christian school in our area. And that's, you know, being a part of the classical tradition, we did learn mythology. And, and I thought, well, maybe that could be true. Mm-hmm. You know, I think the world's chaotic enough to <laughs> be explained by these pagan gods that actually has maybe has something going for it. And um, But it really wasn't until I hit high school that I, um, I think actually had more of an existential ability to yeah. to think about this, right. you know, maybe or, or coming right up into high school, middle school era. Yeah. And that was just because I realized that I, I was actually a sinner. Like I actually mm. had done things that were not okay, yeah. that started to break from an order that I, I just had in my mind that, that God wanted the world to be like, that he created the world right. and he set a beautiful cosmic order to it. And then we're all just around here screwing that up. <laughs> we're not living by that. And, and, I, and there was kind of two thoughts that came to my mind at that point, you know, again, teenager at this point. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I was thinking, on the one hand, I'm not sure if Allah would really have had the patience for us mm-hmm. to be so prodigal in our life away from Him. And then on the other side, and, and as I turned to him, I, I thought, you know, what, what is it that he would have me do that can make up for this ill that I have done? Right. And the answer is really, do better, try harder. And while I didn't really understand the Christian alternative all that well, yeah. it was substantive. It really took our sin seriously. Yeah. God had to die for this. How that worked, I was very confused, and it bugged me for years. Mm-hmm. Um, but I thought this, this has to be the case. Yeah. There, there would be this the fact that God would wait so long for people like me to try and even think about Him yeah. shows that there is an immense amount of love mm-hmm. that's th- that, that is couched in this immense amount of patience. Yeah, that's really it's really fascinating, you know, right? Because you. you you were sort of thinking about the two different worldviews and trying them on, right? And I almost think yeah. that doesn't happen enough in some of our discourse with people sometimes, is that we, we stay too much on the level of kind of granular apologetic questions, but sometimes it's more like, well, I have these base facts of experience, such as my sin, yeah, and then I have to examine these two worldviews and say, what really fits the data, you know, that my yeah. sin is serious? Like, I can 
even whatever I believe about it, it's, it's a serious, the real thing. And so which worldview sort of addresses that fact? And I think, as you say, Christianity really takes it so seriously yeah. in its, yeah. Well, and, I, and, I, and so I was kind of just thrust into a Protestant environment. Sure. I, you know, we, our family was, on my mom's side, was nominally Catholic. But I think that, you know, just the, the school that I was in, yeah. you know, kind of set me in one direction. And, and there were still quite a number of questions that I think were still unaddressed, like yeah. substantive problems, as you're just talking about here, yeah. that were just unaddressed. But I got to know Christ, yeah. and I got to read the scriptures, and, and just absolutely fell in love with Him as I realized that He was just so in love with all of us and with me. Um, and I had amazing mentors. I mean, guys that I, I they're still mentors of, of mine today, uh, like Steve Meyer, who's, who's uh, you know, one of the big movers and shakers in the intelligent design um, uh, movement. Uh, it was you just just was such such a you know paternal figure in my life during that season and, and then scripture scholars like Bruce Walke I mean I mean God was 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 just 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 showing off how much he really liked <laughs> to give good gifts I think yeah. during that season of life yeah. um, and so I went off to uh, Baylor University after high school to in the hope really of studying sacred scripture and. I had a kind of a, an idea and inclination of of wanting to write uh, commentaries in Arabic for Muslims on the sacred scripture. And so I, Bruce Walke, he's, he's a very um, prominent Protestant Old Testament scholar um, and, and very well respected amongst Catholics. I went to the Ecole Biblique in, in Jerusalem mm -hmm. one year. It's not too far off from our family home there. Yeah. And I went down the street for mass and, and kind of there you know, top Old Testament scholar had one of Bruce's books on his desk at that time. Um, and and he told me, look, you know, you can kind of go down the old religious track, uh, you know, in school, like study, do religious studies. But I would recommend that you really study the languages, mm -hmm. like get your Latin, get your Greek, yeah. you know, get your Hebrew if you have time to do that too. Uh, study history. I think that's essential, he told me. Yeah. Uh, and then, and then having a good, um, uh, a, a good grasp of of how that how, how Christians have thought through uh, the Bible is, is 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 just that will set you up very well. And so that's that's what I did. And mm -hmm. Baylor had this amazing department for great texts, and and so I more or less focused in that and. Uh, and then in their philosophy program to do the, what we kind of cobbled together as a as a historical philosophy degree, yeah. uh, along with classics. And again, this was you know God kind of sending His uh, fishing line in and, and trying to draw me closer to Himself, because otherwise I really wouldn't have been exposed to the greater Catholic tradition. Yeah. Um, of, apart from just reading the saints, which yeah. was it was a. Uh, I was able to do at that point. Our guest tonight is Jacob Imam, a former secularist uh, from a Muslim background. He's the executive director of NewPolity.com. Yeah, that's so interesting, Jacob, that it's like, as you said, God gives such great gifts. He showed up with the people, not just to help you along your Christian journey, but really yeah. even on the intellectual side to, to give you the, the tools that are really addressing your questions, you yeah. know, the, the longings and desires of your heart. But also seems like, yeah, they really opened you up to then be ready when God steered you more in the direction of the Catholic Church. So that's really interesting. So what, what, what yeah. what's next there? What happened? So th at that point, there was, I was going to a Protestant uh, church mm -hmm. and there was a rather kind of basic question that needed to be addressed by the church is whether or not communion, which was, n n there was no sense of it being you know, truly Christ, body right. and blood, soul and divinity. This is a non-denominational church? Or, it was. Or, okay. yeah, yeah, it was. Kind of in the Reformed tradition, gotcha. more or less, which I had troubles with. Yeah. Um, but they taught the Bible, so yeah. I liked it. Yeah. And, But there was this question of whether or not communion could only be had in church or at the home. And it was kind of one that they threw their hands up in the air and said, well, you know, probably should be at church, but, you know, who knows? Mm -hmm. I thought, that seems like we should have an answer for that one. Yeah. And and along the same lines, I turned to them and said, well, when should you be baptized? And I said, well, you know, you can kind of do any age. doesn't doesn't really matter, you know, kind of what everybody says. And I said, 
really? We kind of should have an answer for that one. And, and it seemed like those were rather basic questions compared to far more complicated ones about divine simplicity, about Christ's incarnation. How do, you, how do we actually come down to, to the basics there? Mm -hmm. How do we understand like Trinitarian metaphysics? Like really kind of complicated questions in the light of which like whether or not Christ is truly there or, or even where you can have communion or when do you baptize seems to be pretty basic that we should be able to have those along the ways yeah. along the way and and the more people I asked the more kind of confused and garbled the answers answers were garbled the answers were excuse me and uh, and I kind of just went back to that you know that same thrust of when I came into um, well, came to a Christian worldview, came into Christ for the first time. And that was, if I love Christ and I want to get to know Him more, and not having the answers to these questions yeah. is really stopping me from being able to know Him more and thus to be able to love Him more, well then, how much more does He love us? He would totally give us those answers because He craves that intimacy with us even more than I crave it with Him. Mm. And I crave it with Him an immense amount. Yeah. So surely He has some answer out there. And at that same time, I'm reading these, you know, great books from the, from the Christian tradition, mm -hmm. from the Middle Ages in particular. And I thought maybe these guys start to have some answers. What was, now, your, yeah. well, I'm sorry, what was your impression of the Catholic Church? I mean, with your mother having come from the background but fallen away, like what, what, where did it exist in sort of your mental categories? Oh, probably they're idolaters, you okay, know, so you know, the classic, okay, uh, okay. you know, Protestant view of they've gone too far with the Pope, they've gone too far with Mary, they, they you know, used too much incense, Cologne would have done just as well, that sort of thing, you know. Gotcha. And, uh, and I, I guess I really wasn't open to it, sure. to be perfectly okay. honest. Yeah. Uh, instead of actually going down the street and knocking on the door of the of the of the uh, of the church of the Catholic Church there, yeah. I actually ended up calling up an old teacher of mine from high school, who had recently converted from an Assemblies of God background to an Eastern Orthodox one, and I said, "All right, you know about the tradition. Yeah. Tell me what what do you have here?" Yeah. And and he started to teach me these things that I had never heard of before, and that were beautiful, and that illuminated Christ to me. Actually, showed me more of who Christ was, so that I could love Him more. Mm -hmm. um, and I decided from there to ask the local Orthodox priest in, in our college town if he would start to catechize me. Mm -hmm. And, and th that was a long decision, many months sure. in the process, not as long as others, but you know, long enough with a, a good number of, of, of my old uh, Protestant mentors and friends you know, trying to say, like, take it easy. Yeah. Here's the reasons why not. And, and I just couldn't get a good reason of why not, mm -hmm. um, especially if there was a chance of, of coming to greater intimacy with Christ. Mm -hmm. but anyways, I started. Yeah. And what the priest did, he was a great guy. I mean, I really enjoyed him uh, and, and uh, learned so much from him about, about our shared tradition. But he often would articulate orthodox positions on things in juxtaposition to mm. Catholic doctrines. Sure. Sure. And I thought, well, I, first of all, I, that's not really a good pedagogical technique because <laughs> I don't really know those Catholic doctrines at all. Yeah. But also, why do you go to those ones? Like, why is it that it's so important? And then lastly, I kind of came to the decision like, well, I should probably just hear it out of the horse's own mouth. You yeah. know, what do the Catholics actually believe? Mm -hmm. And so I did ultimately go down the street and ask the priest if I could do catechesis jointly at the mm -hmm. same time. And that's, that's what I did. And I did that for about uh, three or four months. Yeah. And at the end of that, I came out with a great respect for Eastern Orthodoxy mm -hmm. and absolutely convicted that I had to become a Catholic. Wow. Um, and one of those moments... Um, well, actually, that came around December time, and mm -hmm. in, a, in a month, I was I was headed off to England uh, to do a kind of a, 
a study abroad, a, vis a visiting studentship uh, over, over in Oxford. And as soon as I arrived, I tried to go into a, try and find a church where I could co continue on with catechesis. I hadn't mm -hmm. been received yet. And I, I remember well, there was a, a number of, of marvelous things that happened. The first day that I was there, I arrived on a Thursday evening, Friday. Uh, during the day, I was walking around, and I passed the Oxford Oratory, and they have a sign out there saying, you know, where uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins was a curate, where J.R.R. Tolkien was a prisoner, and where Cardinal Newman <laughs> had preached. And I thought, well, I, I best go there, I think. And, <laughs> and so Saturday morning, I went to Mass, and I tried to find somebody with a collar afterwards uh, to, to speak with. And there was one, and he was speaking with this old man in the back. And I kind of tried to give them their distance, but they beckoned me over and I explained my plight, saying I was catechumen, just moved over two days ago. I'd love to continue on. And... Uh, the uh, man with the collar said, oh, actually, I'm not the one that you should be talking to. And the old man he was speaking with pointed at him and says, no, this is not the priest. This is the bishop. <laughs> and the bishop, you know, he wasn't wearing any purple, no pectoral cross. He was just visiting yeah. uh, and talking to an old friend. And he pointed back at the old man and said, well, this is the man of Oxford. This mm -hmm. is Walter Hooper. And uh, it was just kind of a surreal moment of being in Oxford for 36 hours and meeting, you know, a successor of the apostle, and then C.S. Lewis, his secretary, yeah. uh, right next to him. I think your dad interviewed Walter some years ago. He did. Ago. Yeah. It's so interesting. This is random here, but at the Coming Home Network, in our newsletter recently, we had, uh, I don't remember the, the man's name, but he was sharing his conversion story, and he had carried on a long correspondence with Walter Hooper. Mm -hmm. So uh, that name has come up recently, but that's so interesting. Yeah, what a, what a chance meeting. What a providential meeting. It was, meeting yeah, no doubt. <laughs> and... Uh, and Walter, ultimately, he, he and I became very, very close, and he became my godfather as I entered into the, yeah. into the church some, some months later, um, and, uh, and which is just, you know, he filled this great paternal void in my life, because my dad did die some years prior, mm -hmm. um, and so I've, I've always been uh, just another great gift that God likes to give, yeah. and, uh, but... When I a couple days later, when I did find the the right man with the right <laughs> collar on, yeah. I I asked him, you know, to continue on with catechesis, and he he asked me, you know, is this catechesis to learn the faith or to become part of it? Mm. And that was just a staggering question for me because before, you know, I'm kind of an intellectual guy. I was thinking about this a lot in my head. I loved, you know, praying the mass, and, and don't get me wrong, but all of a sudden it was a big question. And yeah. he was, he just put that right in my face, and I said, uh, uh, to, "To become Catholic, yeah." And yeah. but, <laughs> but immediately what I did is I tried to find an Orthodox priest <laughs> to talk to. I just needed some last reassurance sure, of sure, like sure. what I was about to do was mm -hmm. the right thing, and I was in Oxford. We're kind of spoiled there with having uh, Metropolitan Callistos Ware there. He's he's an amazing mm -hmm. defender of the faith uh, universally, mm -hmm. um, but also a marvelous expositor of the Orthodox faith particularly. And so we had a chance to meet and talk about a number of things. And one of the questions that I posed to him, I said, um, you know, but Pope Benedict met with a number of metropolitans back in 2008. You know, was that, tell me about that conversation and how, how it went for the sake of unity. You know, because I think that's why they were meeting, wasn't it? Yeah. He says it was, but we also needed to make some decisions, and we couldn't organize our ourselves. So we turned to the Bishop of Rome to head our table. Wow. And I thought right at that moment, well, man, if you need a pope, then I sure do. Yeah. And and that was quite a freeing thing. It was still terrifying to come into to the church, but it was at least freeing to know that really wherever you looked, you needed the unity of Rome. You needed Peter. Yeah. Um, you needed the one that Christ knew we needed. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Man. Yeah. Well, I, but let's pause there. Sorry. A quick break. When you when we come back, I have a few more questions, and then we'll get you into the church there. But I, I particularly want to know, I was thinking, I'd, I'd love to know more. You mentioned loving to pray the Mass. I'd love to know more about your impression of the mass with your background. So I'd like to hear more about sure, that. Yeah. And then again, a few more of those issues. We have many people watching who are 
non-Catholics, non-Christians or non-Catholic Christians, you know, who love Jesus, yeah. you know, um, and their question is, yeah, but, but why Catholic? I already love Jesus. What are some of those issues that you, you know, that you had encountered, that you'd wrestled through, you'd talked yeah. to, to these guys about that clinched it for you? We'll, we'll talk about those when we get back. Great. So thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Journey Home Program. It's not over. Come back for the second half of Jacob's story. Jacob Imam, who's a former secularist from Muslim background, it's a great story. We'll hear the rest of it in just a minute. Welcome back to the Journey Home program. Tonight we, uh, we've been joined by Jacob Imam, who's a former secularist from a Muslim background, and we've been hearing his story so far, you know, coming from, uh, from a background with a Muslim father, Christian mother, uh, having this great uh, intellectual journey, you know, mm. seeking out his answers to his questions. And you, we've got you just on the doorstep of the church here. Yep. You know, we've had these, <laughs> these amazing providential meetings. There's a couple of questions I want to, I wanted to circle back around Two. Uh, one was you. You mentioned uh, really loving to pray the mass at this point in your life, mm -hmm. having experienced that. I, I'd love to know more about that experience, given your background, given what you'd experienced. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in your household, like what what sort of experience was it to encounter the, the mass? Well, I never really. As I mentioned my, my my father came over. It, sure. He he really became taken up by the American dream mm -hmm. and made that his religion. Sure. Um, and for my mother. The, you know, the times that I went to church with her, mm -hmm. it was rather chaotic and disorganized in, mm -hmm. in a Protestant setting. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that too disrespectfully, I, mm -hmm. I, but compared to the the order and the rhythms, the mm -hmm. harmony of the math, mass all fitting together, yeah. it's, it's very dissimilar. Mm -hmm. And for any Protestant heading into uh, a mass for the first time, to a very reverently celebrated mass, yeah. it's it's a it's a, almost a jarring experience. It's right. something completely other. And that, I think, was my experience to yeah. a certain extent, except I went to orthodoxy first. Sure. So I was enjoying the divine liturgy of John Chrysostom, yeah. a prior, which is um, very involved. I mean, it's, you know, you don't have pews, you have, uh, you know, an extraordinary amount of incense, you're moving about, the, there's icons everywhere. Uh, it's, it was exhausting the first time. I mean, it felt like I ran a marathon, and I kind of had to catch my breath and take a nap and <laughs> figure out what yeah. was happening. Okay. Um, and uh, and so to be able to uh, go from that to the the Latin Rite mm -hmm. liturgy, um, this which is you know largely predicated on on silence in comparison mm -hmm. to the Gregorian of of the East, uh, but then more than anything an immense amount of time to adore Christ in the Eucharist. Right. That, that really captured why I, was, I even had this impulse to convert at all. Yeah. I wanted to see Christ's face more clearly. Yeah. I needed to have answers from the tradition to be able to help me up, to be able to see Him. Yeah. And, and there He was. And here was all the time that I needed. Right. And so it was actually in adoration where, where everything started to turn and seeing that, you know, adoration come to its summit and completion. That's, you know, again, again yeah. so interesting there, right? Cause, because you characterize some of the earlier parts of your journey as precisely like this yearning. Like, I want to know, yeah. like, certainly I, I have this relationship with Christ and you were very blessed, you know, to have that, to have received that from the Christians that, that evangelized your mother right. and all that. But you wanted more. Like I want, I want, I want to be instructed here. I want to know how to draw close to Christ. And we have, yeah, in the liturgy, in the treasures of the church, we have this this great tradition of this is how to do it. This is how to give proper worship. This is how yeah. to to draw close to Christ. And that's again, we can talk about. There's the apologetic side of of why that's true and legitimate and biblical and all that. But there's the more practical, experiential side, which is just that this this is that's what this is for. You know, yeah. Christ gave us the Eucharist so that we can draw close to Him in this very unique way. Yeah, so. yeah. You know, and, and St. Thomas actually talks about this where, um, you know, things that have 
are material but without a form mm. can't really be known. So he's, he you know, talks about numbers, for yeah. instance. To think about one is like the concept of one just on its own. It's impossible. You can't do it. Yeah. You have to have one in relation to the material world in, in some regard. Yeah. But God is a form without matter. And so how does that work? And he says, well, we, we can come to know him. But yeah. as we are creaturely, we come to know we are able to understand him, to be able to love him through coming to know things about him from how he's revealed himself. Yeah. You know, first and foremost for through the incarnation, but everything is, is in this cosmos is an externalization of God's internal order. Mm. Um, and so this whole life that we live is just about coming to know him so that we might be able to love him. Yeah. And then we're given the help we need, particularly uh, through revelation and, and the tradition that, that offers that to us. Yeah. So anyways, I no, know that's a bit more intellectual no, that's, than that's some. No, that's really but, good. And yeah, it, may, yeah. it may have already answered my second question, but that was you know, as you had those conversations that mm -hmm. that brought you to become convinced that you needed to become Catholic or at least be open to that, you know, what were some of those some of those things you talked about that yeah. met with that longing that you had? You know, and again, maybe we've already answered that, but if there is anything else there. Well, I think, yeah, the thing that, that really was a concern to me was that we didn't actually, in the Protestant world, we didn't have a method mm -hmm. for being able to understand these things. There was still an immense, I mean, we're facing in the culture at large, this immense amount of relativism. Now that's quickly being replaced by a new form of morality. You know, the fact that soccer stadiums in Seattle, Washington can have big billboards now that say wrong is wrong. It shows that we're kind of at the next phase of our cultural progression right. where our, our more liberal tendencies of just let bygones be bygones is being replaced with um, a more strict mm -hmm. um, way of, that we are to be living. Yeah. But I think, you know, 10 years ago, uh, we were, what was most, you know, what was foremost on many of our minds was this cultural relativism, um, you know, something that Pope Benedict, of course, right. was, was uh, a great spokesman for warning us, I mean, a prophet and warning us about, and, and still, you know, still a problem today, don't get me wrong. Um, but I started to see that as being a problem within the Protestant world. Yeah. You know, if we can't answer these questions where there's, there's still debate to be had yeah. on questions of everything from, from baptism yeah. to divine simplicity, well, we really aren't able to know yeah. as God wants us to know. And, and why is knowing so important? Because we're not able to love as God wants us to love. And so that relativism within Protestantism was alarming. And we need the church, St. Paul teaches us, to be the pillar and, and bulwark for the faith, to actually know yeah. what we need to know, that we might love God well, properly, fully, and forever. Mm -hmm. So that's that was more the, the the concern in my mind was was the relativism yeah. instead of any particular issues. Yeah, yeah. And the need for the church, yeah, as you said, to be the, to be the witness, to be that rock that those out there who are who have that yearning to know to know God, to know Christ, to know how to love Christ. You know, the church needs to be there with. <laughs> settled answers on these important basic questions. Absolutely. You know? And you know, and this was, I mean, really in the next stage, once I was received into the church, mm -hmm. it's been, and it continues to be, this completely challenging journey yes. of learning what the church has told us is true yeah. and what we need to do so yeah. that we might be able to love God and neighbor well. Exactly, yeah. And that is just, you know, it feels like conversion is still, oh, I mean, as it should, I suppose, right. seems active and just as intense as ever. Right, as it should be. Yeah. It should be. Well, let's get you into the church. And yeah. Then, and then, because I want to keep talking about that continual journey. So, that, again, from that point, uh, you were, I can't remember exactly where we left off, but how did you get then into the into the church? So, we left off at, I think, Callisto Swear, yes. saying that yeah. Yeah. the Pope is necessary. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> and and really, from that point on over, I was, I, was, I was terrified, absolutely terrified of receiving the Eucharist, hmm. um, you know, in, in a way that was just, uh, overwhelming, uh, but I, I was I continued on, and Walter um, was right there with me every day. Would go to mass together every day. I'd sit next to him every day, 
Um, and he made sure that I didn't go anywhere else, you know, and he made sure that I got into the church. Um, and coming up to the end, there was, you know, I can't remember, four or five months after that, um, when when the, I, I was to be received. Um, and, I, and, the, and this is the terror of receiving Christ was just overwhelming in the Eucharist. I mean, here's the one that I just loved beyond all else. And I just couldn't. I, it was it was just almost too much. I couldn't handle it. Um, and if, you know, Father Jerem hadn't, you know, if Walter hadn't held, hold, held me down with our, <laughs> uh, <laughs> for Gregory, then, uh, and Father Jerem didn't come straight at me with the Eucharist, I, I might have run the other direction. <laughs> it was kind of like the terror of the Lord seizing you, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I was just so grateful at that point that he did, disguise himself under the cloak of bread and wine, yes. you know, and, uh, but at that point I was in and I was, I was fully in, I was still, um, I had to go back to Texas for the last year of my undergraduate, which I did. And then I, um, was fortunate enough to win, uh, uh an international scholarship to be able to head back to, um, Oxford to continue studying, to be with Walter, to be at the oratory wow. and to continue on, um, and, uh, and it was also during that same period, I was making and had some great friends there, that I also met a guy named Mark Barnes. Uh -huh. uh, Mark was uh, a recent graduate of Franciscan University yeah. of Steubenville. I think you guys Classmate took, of mine. Yeah, yeah, took some classes together. Yeah. And, uh, and a recent grad student at the University of Twickenham in London. Yeah. Uh, and so though we weren't, you know, technically in the same city, we were in the same country and somehow providence again brought us together and and mark started to talk about the social doctrine of our church and he you know he it, it was actually kind of a, a hilarious experience where we never met before yeah and i get an email from him because a fr mutual friend had put us in, in touch and he just said hey do you have a place for me to stay you know i just got off the plane and i thought <laughs> sure man you know and so uh my my friend um, michael and i who are were, were living in, in a house in oxford together his michael's house at the time we went over to the train station and picked up mark and you know he's there with a suitcase and you know wet hair from the rain and he brings out a few social encyclicals of the church and he says, have you heard the goodness of this stuff? And, you know, that was really the next phase of, uh, of being a Catholic for me. You know, I mean, it was a, before I was just in love with the doctrines on God, of ecclesiology, the incarnation. But then all of a sudden, he, you know, there was this, well, not just all of a sudden, but I think in the process of, of yeah. coming to know God more and the church more, I started to have this longing to actually live differently. Right. You know, I started to see that just as my dad yeah. had moved over to America and he still held to the convictions of that Muslims hold to, but not enough to see that the pattern and order of his life was really anything different than the average American right. seeking the American dream. Mm -hmm. So I saw in myself that my, the pattern of my life and the order of my life was really not all that different from the classic Oxford academic. And that's when Mark showed up. Yeah. And Mark said, you know, you got to read this stuff. And, and it just opened up a whole new vista mm -hmm. of Catholic glory. And these were me. encyclicals, papal encyclicals. Yeah, like yeah. like we, we hear the famous okay. ones like uh, Rerum mm -hmm. Novarum by Pope Leo the Thirteenth, or Quadragesimo Anno by Pope Pius the Eleventh, mm -hmm. or Centesimus Annus by John Paul the yeah. Second, and and this uh, this turned me on my side because I think you know an, an important part you know of this uh, of whole, my whole story was reckon was was actually kind of this this economic this financial world in which I was I was born. My dad was. Um, you know, manager at Microsoft, and you know, I will never forget the day when I was 11 years old, and he came to me with, you know, a thick stack of papers, um, which were all the quarterly statements of companies that he was studying, and he taught me how to, you know, read those and and P and L P and Ls, and actually try try to figure out what was a good company to invest in, mm -hmm. and that was 
extraordinarily influential on me and how I spent my free time uh, for, for many of my years growing up. Uh, and I just kind of assumed that the financial order of our world was, I just kind of took it at face value. I think yeah. I thought that's just how it, it was. And um, you can't really say that something that is, is good or bad. It just is. Right. That's right. how I thought about it. And then to start to study the church, and the church says, hey, we got a lot to t say about this. Mm -hmm. And most of it is saying, we don't like the way that our modern world has progressed. The church has really left Christ again. I mean, I think the pattern of, of history in a certain regard, I mean, there's many ways to talk about the pattern of history, sure, but sure. one of them um, is that we were all pagans, mm -hmm. and then Christ came and converted the culture. And we kind of famously call that Christendom, you know, yeah. as it is height in, in the Middle Ages, which is the most luminous era in human history. I think anybody... <laughs> we'll be real clear about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, it's not the Dark Ages. <laughs> we have never been... Humanity has never been so good as we were in the Middle Ages. Um, and then we started to become pagans again, you know, as, as the Protestant um, revolt took over and the secularism of the enlightenment of modernity began to progress... Uh, we started to take on many of the cultural forms of paganism again. And that makes sense. You can only have the gifts of Christ from Christ himself. And so the church is pointing this out in the encyclical tradition and saying, we got we to gotta come back to Christ. Yeah. We got to be able to come back to him. And, uh, and so that really started to turn my world upside down. I took a um, a year off from uh, between my master's and my doctorate, um, and uh, and Mark and, and another great friend of ours, Andrew Willard Jones, um, were able to have me out to Steubenville for some time, and this and and to really start to train me in this vision. Uh, I guess this is still part of my master's um, era, and and to say like, look what we're trying to do here in Steubenville. Um, we are trying to live this out. This is Steubenville for those of. Uh, for those that don't know, is famous for Franciscan University, and, and rightly so. But it's just a properly dilapidated Rust Belt town mm -hmm. that the world has forgotten about after the mills and the mines left. Mm -hmm. And that the only things that people have there are Christ and one another. Um, poverty really set the stage to be able to allow the church to grow. Um, and so it's not like one of these planned communities. It's nothing like that. It's very, very organic um, in the way that uh, it's developed as a community. Um, yeah. It's not like an intentional community in the right, same right, way right. that you might hear that. Um, but I think that the stage was set by poverty um, and then the people were imported by the university and, mm. and then other uh, apostolates around. Um, and so they, they, but but it was not so much the apostles that, that Mark and Andrew were pointing to at that time, but rather the broken down buildings mm. and saying, you know, look, we can try to live lives as Catholics and try to revitalize this town in a way that was and is uh, in accordance with the, the the magisterial tradition of our church, yeah. this the social doctrine of our church. And that was just absolutely inspiring. I think all of us men want a mission, you yeah. know, to live for, something bigger than ourselves to live for. And of course, that's Christ. That's yeah. the church. That's building up the church. But here was actually a chance to. If I stayed in Oxford, mm. my, the pattern and order of my life was just going to stay the same. Mm. If I was going to move back to Seattle where I was raised, the pattern of my life was really going to be able to stay the same. Here is an opportunity, you yeah. know, by the freedom of the world not having its clinches on a town. And you know, as you said earlier, again, this yeah. is this is something I think we can all identify with if we if we try here, because certainly there's different conversions in our life. We come to know Christ, we come to really embrace His church, but then the continuing conversion for every person, yeah. religious, priest, laity, our ongoing conversion is okay. Now, the actual practical patterns of my life are to be conformed to Jesus Christ. This isn't an optional thing. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes we. We, we get so comfortable with a compartmentalized life. I have I have my faith on Sunday, I go to Mass, and maybe I have a Bible study, but the rest of my life remains neutral, remains mine. Um, and we all we all know this, we all encounter it from time to time, like that that can't be the end of the story. Christ is calling me to, to give over my whole life. Yeah. 
Um, and so it, it's just as that stuff was happening in Steubenville, so my mm -hmm. wife and I were there for a few years while I was working on my master's degree, and we were heading out just as some of this stuff was getting started. You know, some of the students were coming down off the hill, and they were, you know, there was a, there was a, um, uh, well, they were they were working on some of the buildings. They were trying to bring yeah. some businesses downtown. And and again, the desire was, as you said, how can we, uh, in our in our real life community, not in social media, in real yeah. life community, yeah. <laughs> our neighbors, you know, the the business, the local businesses, the people who really need us here. Well, if, if Christ has called us to do corporal and spiritual spiritual works of mercy, those people are are there. For a reason, we're here for a reason, you know. Uh, if, and so, yeah. The, now, of course, then we left, and now we're just hearing all this stuff. <laughs> that, you know, the new polity and so many amazing things have been happening as you guys have been trying to work out this stuff there in Steubenville. Yeah, it's been a, it's been an absolute right. I think just to kind of piggyback on your point there, mm -hmm. when the church says that Christ is King, yeah, they really mean it. Yeah, that means that my relationship changes. Mm -hmm. They're like our relationship together changes because. We're not just two guys bumbling through life. We're subjects under the king together. Yeah. And because the king has, has told us how to live, yeah. you know, that really starts to impact our relationship personally. Mm -hmm. and, and, and even it's not just, you know, going to mass on Sunday or, you know, praying in the morning, but it's, uh, you know, what, what am I doing outside of daily mass? Mm -hmm. What am I doing outside my daily rosary? Mm -hmm. You know, there is not one part of this world that Christ does not look at, point to, and claim as his own. Yeah. Everything is to be under Christ our King. And, uh, you know, there's there's many, uh, like, really important things that the popes have given us through the years. And I think to um, uh, people, like, I think I think it was, it was Pius the, the Ninth um, talking about the divorce between the government and the church is... Uh, and something that we celebrate, that divorce, mm -hmm. is being a most pernicious error, he <laughs> says. And, and Pope Leo XIII, he wrote an encyclical about the United States mm -hmm. and addressed to the United States, yeah. um, which is a great one. I think, you know, as Americans, we really should spend some time reading that and consider, considering it. But he says there that when people believe that the divorce between the government and, um, and the church is is good mm -hmm. he says that's that's not true the only way that america can ever be truly itself mm -hmm. is by taking the hand of the church and being led to christ yeah we, there's not one aspect and this is all to say it's not to say that the state should take over and start making catholic laws right. i really don't think that's right a good idea let alone true i yeah. don't think that the church is saying that mm -hmm. um but should like we saw in the Middle Ages, like Leo the Third, or Leo Leo the uh, Saint, sorry, excuse me, Saint Louis the Ninth, um, being baptized, mm -hmm. confirmed, mm -hmm. married in the church, and then through uh, the the those graces through the sacraments from the sacraments, living out his Catholic apostolate as king, well, we should be doing that too, right. in, in every aspect of our life. Yeah. And so that's, I think, just been a, a huge realization for me and, and a whole slew of conversions that I've had to undergo. And yeah. probably the biggest one, as I mentioned, was, was financial. Mm -hmm. um, you know, finding that you know, Christ really doesn't have a lot of good things to say about money, right. you know, in, in, the, in the scriptures. And the rich man, you know, doesn't, doesn't have a good outlook, you know, for him in the scriptures as right. well. And then to see throughout the, 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 the early church, you know, again, taking this, this teaching from Christ and trying to understand what it means. Well, they're pretty rigorous about that, too, where you find that, right. uh, like St. Gregory the Great, who's quoted in the 1996 Catechism, saying it's not just a right of charity, but also of justice to, be, to pay for the poor. And once our necessities have been met in this mm -hmm. life, then everything else ought to be going to the poor. Yeah. I mean, these are big statements. Yeah. These are radical statements, and they're in things like the catechism. Right. You know, yeah. in the, because of the discourse yeah. in the modern world, obviously yeah. what people's minds go toward whenever they hear this kind of stuff is, yeah. is and as you addressed it earlier, does this mean, okay, the, the government needs to get involved? And the, like, yeah. And one of the, the emphases that you guys, uh, you and Mark did a, a good podcast series, I highly recommend that you guys ended up calling Good Money on the mm -hmm. New Polity Podcast. But 
And the emphasis is that the Christian answer is, is personal virtue. Absolutely. Like that's where it's built up from. Is that not, not that, that, that the church is teaching that, oh, the, you know, those people out there need to do this, or the government <laughs> needs to do this. No, it's that, no, no, you are called to be virtuous with your money. That's right. I, well, not, uh, there they go, saying you again. No, I, I, <laughs> I am called to turn my whole life over to Christ. And, and one comment that you guys made at one point was that, you know, th- reflecting on the, the rich young ruler, the, the story of Christ yeah. encounters the rich young ruler, um, that prudence does not mean, it's not the question of, of whether I am to live out the gospel radically, it's, it's how. Yep. Right? And so, again, all of our lives, that's going to be instantiated a little differently, right? We have to discern that for ourselves, but each one of us is called to that level of radical surrender to Jesus Christ. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's so true. And it's, it, it, at first, it's, um, it's, it's scary. Mm-hmm. And it's terrifying. And you even think that can't be right. right. And that was how I was. But it's like a, a little kid. I mean, you know, it's like if the four-year-old is just like stole something from his little sister, what do you have to do? You have to take the little four-year-old, bring him back, and probably what sounds like to him a very esoteric manner, <laughs> share. You know, yeah, you have yeah, to yeah. teach him to do good mm-hmm. so that he might know the good. Uh, you know, that's how we come to actually know what the good is, is that we do the good. Mm-hmm. And through knowing the good, we might be able to love the good. Yeah. And the truth is that we're just, you know, we adults are just tall children. <laughs> we learn the good the same way that kids do. We have to do the good so that we might know the good, that we might love the good. And for me, I mean, coming along and reading those encyclicals, getting back to the, yeah, to that story, yeah. it was wow, they're telling me to do things that are very different from how I'm living right now. Mm-hmm. And at one point, you know, I'm just writhing on the couch, like trying to figure out what am I supposed to do with my, with my finances. And, you know, my wife just laughs at me because she <laughs> saw like what internal turmoil I was going through. Um, but I just had to, you know, kind of take the hand of the popes. And as my spiritual father, mm-hmm. just as I, you know, the, the parent would with the little kids, and redirecting them, I just let them redirect me, mm-hmm. my fan- finances, and found that I, I've actually, now I think I understand the good a little bit better. Yeah. You know, before I thought it was ludicrous what they were telling me to do. Right. I, I think I see it, and now, I'm, praise God, I'm finally at the point of loving it. Yeah. So. Well, and it's like everything, I think, in, you know, in the faith, in Scripture, we, we encounter it initially as a limitation of our freedom. Yeah. But then we experience mm-hmm. it as this opportunity for an adventure in Christ. And Absolutely. We, for the church presents us with, you know, commandments and rules and obligations. But when they're, ex- we're in Lent right now, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, if, <laughs> no, no meat this Friday. Dang, you know, that's such a limitation of my freedom. But when we embrace that fast, that penitential time of Lent, then we discover a new opportunity for freedom and for creativity and for, again, doing the good and, and knowing the good in yeah. Christ. I've been thinking about it this this Lent, like all those yeah. kind of urgings to go back to the things that you know we've we've given up, yeah. the good things that we've given up. I just think that urging, whenever I have that, I go, oh, wonderful! That's a place where I can yeah. bring more of Christ into my life. This right. is where I'm not, I don't have enough of Him. Yeah, and, and that's going to be much much more savory than anything I can put in my mouth right now. <laughs> well, we got we got two minutes left. Uh, right. I want to make sure again. Well, there's one thing I want to emphasize again that this is. You exemplify, you're, you're discussing here, the journey continues. You know, yeah. one of the reasons why we share stories on this show is because each of us is to look in our life and see the story because God yeah. is doing things in your life, you know, but the journey doesn't end when you become a Christian or you're baptized or you become Catholic and the journey continues. Um, but I do want to make sure that you get a chance um, with a minute and a half to go. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about New Polity and how the people can find more information about your work and sure whatever you'd like to share there. Well, New Polity is kind of a part think tank, part venture studio is the way that I like to talk about it. On the side of the think tank, we're looking back at the tradition and saying, what has Christ told us about his kingdom? Mm. This kingdom is real. It's actual. It's physical. It's not esoteric. It's not just ethereal. It's Mm. something that we get to live out. What has the church told us about it? So we're digging into the tradition there, researching it, and trying to teach it uh, to a wider audience. And then on the other side, we're trying to instantiate it as well by building businesses that reflect the ways that the church has told us to do that. Um, things such as uh, employee ownership and, um, and being able to have a wider distribution of productive property. We really are big into ownership as Catholics. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so you can find us and what we're doing uh, there at newpolity.com. 
Um, one of the more recent things that we've started was the Steubenville Workshop. Uh, you can find that at steubenvilleworkshop.com. Nice. Um, but uh, we we just uh, you know invite you to journey along with us and finding more of Christ in every nook and cranny of our life. Awesome. Well, that's a great project. Thanks so much, Jacob, hey, for your story so for, for sharing about that. And thank you for joining us on this episode of the Journey Home program. Again, if you, if you were touched by Jacob's story, uh, there, there's so many more of those stories. You can check out the archive at chnetwork.org uh, of other programs, but also you know many stories, written, uh, video, etc. So check that out. And again, uh, this has been EWTN's uh, The Journey Home program. I'm your guest host, John Mark Grodi. We'll see you again next week. God bless.